take some examples. The most famous such example in condensed matter physics is the Congo problem, how electrons interact with uh, uh, isolated spin degrees of freedom. Um, in, uh, um, in high energy physics, there's something called the kallen rubikoff effect, which is a, a beautiful problem um, to do with fermions scattering off magnetic monopoles that, that has some very interesting uh, physics. Um, finally, and more recently, it's a problem that um, arises in trying to understand the physics of SPT phases, uh, symmetry protected topological phases in, in condensed matter physics. That's really gonna be the, um, the focus of, of what I'll be doing in this talk, and I'll explain a little more about that as, uh, as we go along. All right, so the, um, the basic question I want to ask in this talk is um, what symmetries can you preserve in the presence of a boundary and what the properties of those boundary conditions are? Um, and in particular, I'm going to be interested in chiral symmetries. So um, for the most part, I'm gonna be thinking about massless fermions, massless fermions moving on a line. Um, massless fermions move at the speed of light, which means they have two options. They can either go that way at the speed of light or that way at the speed of light. And I want to think about boundary conditions that preserve uh, symmetries where the, I'm gonna get confused with the mirroring on Zoom, the right moving fermions, for you guys, uh, where the right moving fermions carry different charges from the left moving fermions. Okay. So to give you a concrete example to, to have in, in your mind, suppose you have two Dirac fermions in one plus one dimensions and give the two fermions going that way charges three and four under a U1 symmetry. And the two fermions going that way give them charges five and zero. And I want to put a boundary condition that preserves that charge under fermions without um, Now, you might be forgiven for thinking this surely just can't be possible. There's a very simple thought experiment. I, I put a boundary, what, what happens if I throw in a fermion of charge three? What, what can possibly bounce back? The fermions that bounce back have charge five and zero. It seems like there's, uh, th there's no option. And um, it turns out that uh, it's certainly true that it's not possible to write down simple conditions on the fermionic fields, which preserve these kind of um, uh, symmetries at the boundary. But it is nonetheless possible to have boundary conditions that preserve this symmetry. And there's various ways uh, to do it. Um, perhaps the sort of intuitively most straightforward way, although it turns out not to be the way to, to actually solve these things, but the intuitive way is, is just to add some extra degrees of freedom on the boundary. So you could imagine putting on the boundary maybe some rotor degrees of freedom, think just little quantum mechanical things that, that spin around, and when they spin around they can um, soak up some charge. So if you have extra degrees of freedom on the boundary which can soak up the charge, then indeed something can come in and something uh, with one charge and some different charge can, can come out. Um, now, there's lots of different ways to cook up degrees of freedom on the boundary, but if you look at very low energies, um, energies much smaller than any characteristic energy scale to do with what's going on on the boundary, um, it turns out there's a universal description of these boundary conditions. Uh, it's a description in terms of conformal field theory or, or what's known as boundary conformal field theory. And uh, that's going to be the, the kind of tools that I'll be using to describe these, um, these boundary conditions uh, throughout this talk. All right, so, so that's the goal, just to try and um, explore the kind of boundary conditions that, um, uh, that, that one can put on. Um, bef before I jump in and, and start showing you some details, uh, I just want to try and motivate why I care about this, because it's a fairly technical subject. So, so why, why would on earth would I be care caring about this? Um, th there's really, well, there's sort of two motivations. In, in fact, there's a whole circle of ideas of, of motivations, but um, here's, here's one motivation. Uh, it's the following very simple question. Um, if you take massless fermions and you give them a mass, uh, what symmetries do you break when you give them a mass? Um, I think this is a very interesting question in part because for about 20 years, I thought I knew the answer. Uh, and then in recent years, um, condensed matter uh, colleagues have convinced me that really I don't understand this, this question at all. The, the reason I thought I knew the answer was, was that if you just look at the Lagrangian for free fermions and you add a quadratic term, the quadratic term breaks some symmetries. Um, if you're in even dimensions, it breaks chiral symmetries, axial symmetries. Um, if you're in odd dimensions, it breaks things like parity or, or time reversal, or at least something related to that. Um, and I always, I just thought that was, that was the end of the story. Um, that is the end of the story for free fermions, or indeed for weakly interacting fermions. But if you have strong interactions, it's possible, and we know of certain examples, where you can give fermions a mass 
preserving symmetries that you might naively thought were, would be broken. And that's the kind of question that I'd really uh, like to explore. It turned out to be a rather difficult question to explore. Um, but the question about boundary conditions is sort of a nice halfway house. Um, and they're related for the, for the following reason. Uh, suppose you have your massless fermions in a line for us, but more generally um, uh, uh, in any dimension of space. You can consider turning on a mass just in one half of that space. And then you send in the massless fermions from, from the gapless side. Um, if you send them in with very low energy, they can't enter the gap region because they don't have enough energy, so they have to bounce off. And whatever um, symmetries are preserved when you gap one half of the space have to be preserved in the effective boundary conditions for these massless fermions. So there's this intricate connection between the kind of symmetries that can be preserved when you give fermions a mass and the kind of symmetries that can be preserved when you put fermions on a, on a manifold with boundary. Um, it turns out that putting fermions on a manifold with boundary is much easier to understand than, um, than giving them a mass. So that's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm looking at this. Um, by the way, for what it's worth, the folklore in the literature, um, which is far from being proven, is that you can give um, a mass to any fermions, providing that they don't, they don't suffer an anomaly. Um, that's totally striking. For example, the folklore, if you import it from condensed matter into high energy physics, is that it should be possible to give all the uh, fermions in the standard model a mass without breaking electroweak gauge symmetry. Um, that's a totally shocking statement. Um, because, let me remind you, the, the successful prediction of the Higgs boson came from the fact that we thought it was not possible to give fermions a mass without breaking electroweak gauge symmetry. Nonetheless, it seems like there might be some things that, um, that we're missing, um, and I'd just like to understand what those, those things are. So that's, um, that's, well, that's one of the reasons. There are, there are several other reasons as well that, that may become important as we, as, as we go through the talk. But that's sort of the collection of ideas that, um, that I'm thinking about here. All right, that, that's the end of my, my rambling introduction. I'm gonna start showing you some slides, but I'm very happy to, uh, to take any questions before we, um, we kick off with the formal part of the talk. So David, I have a curiosity in terms of motivations. Yeah. I mean, I mean is also the fact that uh, adding fermions and understanding the boundary condition is useful if you want to plan lattice models like lattice gauge theories and so on and so forth uh, actually that that's one of the main motivations that i have but it, it there's a a problem in theoretical physics which i think you, you know a, a wise man once told me when you when you deciding what to work on in theoretical physics you should do the following you should take how important the problem is and then you should divide by the number of other people that are already working on it um, but by this metric, I think the most important problem in theoretical physics is how you put chiral fermions on the lattice. And in particular, how you put the standard model on the lattice, which, which is, remains a, a, an unsolved problem after, after 40 years. These kind of questions uh, go some way towards addressing that. You know, if you put fermions on a lattice, you get doublers. If there's some way to lift the doublers remaining, leaving behind the, the fermions that you want, um, that would that would basically solve the problem. So, so there is a lattice motivation that actually is the big motivation um, underlying this. I'm not sure that was quite the direction you had in mind, but. Yes, 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 thank you. Other questions? All right, let, let me uh, share my screen with you all. All right. Um, oh no, can you see the screen? Is it, is it good? And, and the, arrow thing as well, the cursor. Yeah, yeah, it works, yeah. All right, um, so everything I'm gonna tell you is um, based on a series of three papers that, that have come out over, over the last year um, with my completely excellent steward, uh, student, Philip Boyle Smith. Um, I, I should stress from the beginning, everything is due to Philip. I know all, all the theorems that he proved, uh, and it, it was just quite astonishing uh, what, what he did here. Um, to give you some sense, um, not only did Philip learn boundary conformal field theory to do this project, um, having learned it, he then taught me boundary conformal field theory. Um, it, he's really very, very impressive student. Um, in return, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do you the favor of not teaching you boundary conformal field theory. Uh, it's a very technical subject. Um, and everything that underlies um, the statements in this talk 
uh, have proofs using boundary conformal field theory, but they're, they're very messy at, at times. So I'm going to tell you the statements, which are very easy to, um, to explain, but I'm going to hide all of the, the, the dirty details from you, um, but you can find them all in, uh, in these papers. All right, um, so uh, this um, uh, is where we're going. Um, I'm going to start by telling you that all possible boundary states for fermions in two dimensions um, fall into one of two classes. There's a, a Z2 classification uh, of boundary states in, in one plus one dimensions. It's related to a Z2 classification of SPT phases, uh, for those of you who, who know what they are, in, in one plus one dimensions. Um, it, it boils down to what's called a mod two anomaly. So I'm gonna start by explaining that. Uh, then I'll go on and tell you about the chiral boundary states that, that I care about. And then I'm gonna go on and tell you about some properties of these chiral boundary states, and in particular about the ways they're connected to each other through, through what's called boundary RD flow, all of which I'll explain. Um, I, I, should, I should warn you, I, I, at the end I have a couple of cute little applications, one of which I think well I understand and the other one of which I don't. Um, one of which is to do with a uh, two plus one SPT phases and the other one is to do with the kalan rubikov effect, which uh, I mentioned in the introduction. I, I gave this talk yesterday and, and I ran out of time after section three. So, so I might get to section four and five, but it, it seems likely that um, I'll just run out of time. All right, so let me start with uh, telling you about the, the mod two anomaly. Um, anomaly is a word that's just used way too much in, uh, in, in theoretical physics. Um, the anomaly I'm gonna talk about here is an inconsistency. Uh, you write down a classical theory and uh, it looks very nice, but the quantum theory doesn't make any sense. Most familiar are, are gauge anomalies, although this one turns out not to be. Here is what I think that is the simplest example of an anomalous, meaning inconsistent, quantum theory. Uh, it's in quantum mechanics, zero plus one dimensions, and it's a single real fermion. So a single Majorana fermion lambda. Uh, I claim, actually I, Witten claimed this, but following Witten, I claim this is an inconsistent quantum theory. All right, so um, why is it an inconsistent quantum theory? The simplest way to think about it is, is to take two of them. Take two Majorana fermions, lambda one and lambda two. Um, if you look at the commutation relations of two Majorana Meyer, fermions, um, they form the Clifford algebra in two dimensions. But the Clifford algebra in two dimensions has an irreducible representation that acts on a two dimensional Hilbert space. Another way to say it is you can, you can pair two real fermions into a single complex fermion, which then you act as a creation operator. So the, the two states in the Hilbert space is no fermion or yes fermion. They're the, the, the two options, and you can't have two fermions because they're fermions and they have a power exclusion. All right, so um, two Majorana fermions act on a Hilbert space of dimension two, but if you then uh, assume some simple tensor factorization, that means a single Majorana fermion must act on a Hilbert space of dimension square root of two. But that's nonsense. There's no such thing as a Hilbert space of square root of two. Um, you can actually do the calculation of the dimension of the Hilbert space explicitly. You can take the path integral, you can compute the path integral with anti-periodic boundary conditions in Euclidean time. Um, that path integral always computes um, the trace of one. Trace of one is the same thing as the dimension of the Hilbert space. If you do that, you find that the answer is indeed root two. So a single Majorana fermion in quantum mechanics does not make any sense. Two of them are needed uh, to make sense. But by the way, it was probably Kitaev who first really stressed this rather than Witten. This, this underlies Kitaev's Majorana chain from, uh, um, from, I think, 20 years ago. All right, so that's, that's Majorana fermions in quantum mechanics. Um, Majorana fermions in, other, in higher dimensions are perfectly fine. Um, you can have Majorana fermions in, in two, three, and four space-time dimensions. Nothing wrong with them. Um, however, this inconsistency rears its head if you can consider them on manifolds with boundaries. So um, let me explain why. We'll take a Majorana fermion in one plus one dimensions. I'll call it chi. And um, for just the next two slides, I'm gonna make the fermion massive. Uh, at some point, I'm gonna make them massless, but, but it's useful just for pedagogical reasons to, to make them massive. So we have a massive Majorana fermion in one plus one dimensions, and I'll put a boundary. And there's two possible boundary conditions that you can put on. The left mover turns into the right mover, but it can turn into the right mover with a plus or minus sign at the boundary. So here are the two boundary conditions. Um, now just solve the Dirac equation in the presence of the boundary subject to those boundary conditions. 
uh, you'll find that there's the following solution. It's, it's the kind of solution that Jakeev and Rebbe found long ago when looking at fermion zero modes in the background of solitons. Um, there's a, a characteristic exponential factor times a Majorana quantum mechanical mode, which is localized at the boundary. And this exponential factor um, does one of two things. It either decays as you go into the physical region of space, or it grows as you go into the physical region of space. If it grows, this is not a state in the Hilbert space because it's not normalizable, and you just throw it out and there's nothing, nothing wrong. If it decays, this is a normalizable solution to the Dirac equation, and it corresponds to a state in the Hilbert space. But it corresponds to a state in the Hilbert space, which is a single quantum mechanical Majorana fermion localized near the boundary. That's precisely the kind of system that we've just said is, is inconsistent. So if you have um, a massive Majorana fermion on the line, um, some boundary conditions have localized Majorana modes, and you, want, you have to worry about the fact that they may, may be inconsistent. Um, there's various ways to deal with the inconsistency, but nonetheless, you have to worry that that, that single Majorana mode might be inconsistent. But by the way, we, uh, we can see from, from here, um, the choice of which condition is consistent and which is inconsistent um, depends on the sign of, of the mass M. It also depends on whether it's the left or right boundary, so you're going X positive or, or, or X negative. All right. Um, to just rehash this in a slightly different way, um, let me consider the story for uh, a Dirac fermion in, in one plus one dimension. So a Dirac fermion is, is a complex fermion, it's two Majoranas. Um, again, there, there's two different choices of boundary conditions. Um, one choice uh, is, I think, the natural one. It's the left moving Dirac fermion turns into the right moving Dirac fermion. Um, by the way, when I write this, I mean that uh, these are conditions imposed at the boundary. Um, as you can see, the boundary condition preserves the, the U1 symmetry, which, uh, which rotates the phase of, of the Dirac fermion. Um, that means that this can serve particle number or, 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 or charge number. Um, in terms of the two Majoranas, uh, this condition um, imposes the same kind of boundary condition on chi1 and chi2. That means that with this condition, you either have zero Majorana modes localized at the boundary, or you have two Majorana modes localized at the boundary. Either way, there's nothing to worry about. You've got an even number. However, there's a different kind of condition that you could um, impose, which is psi left equals psi right dagger. So it doesn't, it doesn't conserve uh, particle number or charge, but it is a boundary condition which is important. It, it's responsible for what's called Andreev reflection. So if you have a wire attached to a superconductor, um, an electron goes in, uh, the superconductor doesn't preserve charge because of the, the Cooper pair condensate, and Andreev reflection is the process where a, a, a hole uh, bounces back. Um, Andreev reflection is um, imposed mathematically precisely by these kind of boundary conditions. Um, again, if you look at what it means in terms of the two Majoranas, um, one of the Majoranas has one sign for the boundary condition, and the other Majorana has the other sign. So with these kind of boundary conditions, you're guaranteed to get a single Majorana mode. Um, regardless of the sign of the mass of the Dirac fermion. So again, it's a boundary condition that you're going to have to worry about. Um, uh, taken naively, it's anomalous, it's inconsistent, but you need something else to, um, uh, to rectify that anomaly um, uh, if you want to impose such boundary conditions. All right. Um, sorry, can I, can I ask a question? Uh, hey, Hi. Francesco, how are you? Good. Hi. <laughs> Um, so about this uh, inconsistency of the quantum mechanics of, of a single Majorana, um, so is this an inconsistency that can be cured or, or just, I mean, we have to give up the theory in the sense no. that, uh, so, so uh, as you said, the, the, you can compute the partition function, you get the square root of two, but you can compute it. So if you apply a path integral formulation, where, where do you see that there is something wrong? Oh, that there are... There are various ways. If, if you compute it, in, it with Ramond boundary conditions, um, it's zero. It's zero precisely because there's a zero mode. But the, the, the zero mode is, um, um, is telling you that, that um, uh, what it wants to compute is an expectation value for a single fermion. That, 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 that doesn't make sense. So it, it's, it's, it's not so easy to see in the path integral formalism, but it's certainly true in the, in the you know, canonical formalism that it's... Uh, um, it, it's inconsistent. But by the way, it's very easy to cure, and I'll, I'll give you some examples on the, um, on the following slide. And of course, if you start with a quantum field theory in higher dimensions, um, 
somehow, it, you know, if that was consistent, it's guaranteed to cure it in some way. And, and we'll see various uh, examples of that in this talk. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I've introduced the mass on the past two slides for, for the fermion. It was purely as a crutch. The, the nice thing about the mass is it shows the inconsistency of this localized uh, uh, zero mode. Um, but as always, anomalies are always independent of the mass. And so moving forwards, I'm going to set the mass to zero, but these anomalies are still going to survive. Arnav, you had a question. Yeah. So you computed a partition, basically computed the square of the partition function and took a square root, right? So what fixed this? Is there any reason to believe the sign to be plus? No, I don't think so. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I don't know what happens if you pick the other sign. I, I, don't, I, I don't see an option for that, that sign choice in the consistent theories. Yeah, I, I don't know is the answer to your question. And so, is there any reason, is there any way you know that the square root of two can be computed just for one of them from a Hamiltonian perspective? Not, not, no, not, not without taking the square root of, literally taking the square root of two. Okay. Uh, but by meaning taking two Majorana fermions and, and then taking the square root. No, I, I don't know of such a way. So if the thing you were saying to uh, Francesco, if I understood it correctly, you said that for one of them, for Ramon boundary condition, there is an anomaly of the minus one to the power f, right? So, and I believe the statement in the Hamiltonian picture is that the, there is no uh, non-projective representation of minus one to the power f on the smallest representation of the Hilbert space. So in that sense, I think the anomaly can be understood from the Hamiltonian perspective. But I, 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 I have been uh, asked, I don't know, is there a way to get the square root of two somehow from a Hamiltonian? Not, not that I know of, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, uh, Francesco said, how, how can we deal with, it, with this anomaly? There's various ways to deal with it. Um, the, the real lesson I want you to take from the, past, from the previous slide is the boundary conditions fall into one of two different classes. That was psi left equals psi right? or psi left equals psi right dagger. Um, one of those classes gives the Majorana mode on the end. Um, if you have um, now the system on an interval uh, rather than, th than a half line, um, if you put the boundary condition here, which has a localized Majorana mode, um, you're obliged to put the boundary condition here that also has a localized Majorana mode. Yeah, if you don't do anything else, at least, if you don't do any of the other things on the list on, on this slide. Um, then you get two uh, localized Majorana modes. Um, it doesn't matter that they're, they're separated in space. Um, you still have an even number. And so the system is, is perfectly consistent. Um, the problem arises if you pick one boundary condition on one end and the, uh, a boundary condition from the other class on the other end. That then gives you just one Majorana mode on, a, on one end, and then you're left with a, an, an inconsistent theory. So um, you, you can patch it up in a very simple way on an interval with a boundary just by putting the same boundary conditions on, on both ends. Um, there's other very simple ways in which you can, you can cure the boundary, um, uh, cure this anomaly. If, if you have a single Majorana mode here, you could just add by hand another Majorana mode, which is, is localized on the boundary. It seems trivial, um, but uh, we'll actually see examples where, where these kind of things are dyna uh, generated dynamically as, uh, as we go on. Um, finally, there's a, there's a lovely way to, to cure this, um, which I'm going to skip over a little bit because it's, um, uh, it's not really relevant for this talk. Um, but uh, there's a topological field theory um, called the ARF theory. Uh, it's a topological field theory whose partition function on a general Riemann surface with a spin structure is minus one to a topological invariant called the ARF invariant. Um, it turns out that that theory is ill-defined on a Riemann surface with a boundary and um, the anomaly it suffers is precisely the same anomaly that um, uh, you get by putting the dodgy boundary conditions. So actually this ARF topological theory enforces on you. Uh, the by the way, for the, for the string theorists in the audience, that there's a beautiful uh, story which, which I just want to advertise. It, it was um, in a paper uh, last year by, by Yuji Tachikawa and friends, um, but they were really fleshing out an idea from a talk by Witten um, from a couple of years ago. Um, the GSO projection that you do on the string can actually be understood in terms of ARF invariant topological field theories that live on the world sheet of, of the string. And then um, the possible boundary conditions you can impose on fermions, which really correspond to the kind of D-brains that, that one can have, um, are um, related to this mod, mod 2 anomaly. And when the dust settles, you can understand all sorts of beautiful things in terms of this anomaly, like for the fact that um, 
Type 2A has D0, D2, D4, and even spatial world volume dimensions. Type 2B has the others. Um, but the non-BPS brains, which live in between, um, have a tension which is bigger by a factor of the square root of two. It's precisely that square root of two of an extra uh, Majorana mode. So a lot of the things that Ashok Sen and others understood about D-brains in um, the 1990s um, uh, can be understood in terms of this, this topological field. All right, I'm going to close the door as well. One second. <laughs> Um, let me now move on. That was for a single uh, Dirac fermion. Let me now tell you about two, um, uh, oh sorry, about multiple uh, Dirac fermions. Um, again, the, the real lesson is going to be that all boundary conditions for fermions fall into one of two classes uh, due to this, this mod 2 anomaly. All right, so this is the general setup I, I want to consider. Um, we're going to consider two n massless fermions. Now it's going to be massless for the rest of the talk. Um, or equivalently, n Dirac fermions in, in one plus one dimensions. And uh, the symmetries, um, uh, well, the question I want to ask is, is what symmetries can be preserved on the boundary? And the answer, which, which um, I think is folklore, um, is the following. It should be possible to preserve any symmetries that do not themselves suffer from a Toft anomaly. Um, I say it's folklore because I, I know of examples of boundary conditions that I would love to construct where I do not know how. Um, they're chiral boundary conditions, but they don't suffer from a top anomaly. Um, nonetheless, I think this is probably the, the, the correct statement. And we're certainly going to see in this talk that we'll be able to construct boundary conditions, but only those that, that don't suffer from an anomaly. Um, so, so what's an example? The anomaly cancellation condition in um, one plus one dimensions is that the sum of the squares of the fermions for the right movers has to equal the sum of the squares of the fermions for the left movers. So in the introduction, I gave you the example of, of two left movers with charges three and four, and two right movers with charges five and zero. Um, those numbers weren't picked randomly, they're the smallest Pythagorean triple, so that um, uh, they satisfy um, this anomaly cancellation condition. All right, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, there's a um, a technology that underlies this talk, which is the technology of boundary conformal field theory. Um, and I'm not really going to say as little as I can about it, but I just want to give you some idea of, of, of how this works. Um, it's an idea due to Cardi um, from, uh, from the late 80s, um, and it's the following. You, you start with this picture here, which is your um, system on an interval with some boundary condition A at one end and some boundary condition B at another end. And you want to compute the partition function, and to compute the partition function, you can pactify Euclidean time. That's this blue circle direction. And off you go and, uh, and compute. Um, Card's idea was very simple. It's just you do a modular transformation, which um, graphically is just turning the thing on its side. And you view um, what was the spatial direction as time, and what was the temporal direction as, uh, as a new space. Now, in a quantum theory, um, uh, the space of um, the states in the Hilbert space live on a spatial slice. So the boundary conditions A and B uh, after this um, modular transformation, or what string theory is called open closed string duality, um, the boundary conditions become are encoded in um, states in a Hilbert space that live um, at the bottom and the top uh, of this cylinder. So Cardi explained um, how, uh, if you want certain boundary conditions, you can understand them in terms of states of the Hilbert space. The states have to have certain properties called Cardi conditions. Uh, those Cardi conditions are not very easy to, to solve in general, which is why um, uh, it's not trivial to write down um, these boundary conditions. Um, but the whole technology is, is to write things in terms of states in the Hilbert space rather than actual, actual boundary conditions. All right, so this is the setup I'm, I'm going to be um, uh, using. We're going to have n Dirac fermions or two n Majoranas, um, and I want to preserve a u1 to the n symmetry. So it's a, a maximal um, abelian symmetry for, um, for these Dirac fermions. Um, the left movers are going to have charges q, sorry, right movers are going to have charges q bar, and the left movers are going to have charges q um, under these symmetries. q is a matrix, i goes from 1 to n and labels the fermion, and alpha goes from 1 to n and labels the particular u1 symmetry that, that we're thinking about. Um, there shouldn't be any Toft anomalies under uh, these symmetries. That means Toft anomalies under each U1, but also mixed Toft anomalies. 
So the requirement that there are no Toft anomalies is the statement that, um, uh, well, these n squared statements here. You sum over the n fermions, but the alpha and beta labeling the different u1s um, are, are left floating in, in this equation. So I want to pick a bunch of q's and a bunch of q bars um, where uh, this statement holds. Okay. For what it's worth, if you have three, four, and five, zero, you can always aug augment them with uh, uh, four minus three and zero, five going the other way. So it's, 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 if you have a particular u1 symmetry that you want, um, and you don't care about the other n minus one, you can always find a, a, an n minus one that, um, that, that, that obey this condition. So you have a full u1 to the n uh, at the end of the end. All right, it's gonna turn out that um, all the results I'm going to tell you about don't care about q and q bar individually, but they only care about this combination. So uh, you take the inverse of q bar and multiply it by q. Um, one thing I should have said, but didn't say, uh, q's are integer valued. Um, it's important the charges are going to be integers. That means that this matrix R has rational elements because I divide by or take the inverse of a, an integer valued matrix. Um, moreover, this R is a, ra is a rational orthogonal matrix. Uh, the orthogonality of R just follows from that Toft anomaly cancellation condition um, on the previous slide. So to give you some uh, simple examples, if you do the, the normal boundary conditions, psi left goes to psi right, this matrix R is just a unit matrix. If you do Andreev reflection for every one of the n fermions, this matrix R is, is minus the unit matrix. Um, however, if you want to do um, uh, something more funky, where the left moving fermions have very different charges from the right moving fermions, um, then R will in general be uh, a more interesting uh, rational orthogonal matrix. All right, the actual mathematical object that's going to appear everywhere uh, is derived from R and it's the following charge lattice. So you do the following uh, procedure. Start with the lattice Z to the N. So in Rn, just draw a dot at every point uh, with, with integer value coordinates. It's a big lattice. Um, take every point in that lattice and rotate it by the matrix R. If after the rotation by the matrix R, a point ends up at another point on the lattice, keep that one. But if after a rotation by a matrix R, it ends up just floating around somewhere in the middle, throw it away. So um, given a matrix R and an original lattice Z to the N, you can construct a new lattice that I'm going to call lambda. Okay. Um, get some intuition for, for what lambda is. Uh, if the left moving fermions and the right moving fermions have the same charges, R is the unit matrix and lambda is just Z to the N. Uh, what happens is as the charges for the left movers and the right movers start to differ more and more. R is typically a matrix that has um, a big number in the denominator of, uh, of, of the entries. That, that means that it rotates you just a little bit. The fact it rotates you just a little bit means that to find some lattice vectors which get rotated into other lattice vectors, you have to go quite a long way out. You're always guaranteed to find some just because R is an, uh, a rational matrix, but you may have to go quite a long way out from the origin before you find one which when you rotate it gets rotated into uh, another lattice vector. Um, what it means is that the bigger the difference between the left and the right moving charges, the sparser this lattice lambda. But that's the, the, the intuition to have in mind. By the way, everything I'm going to tell you for the rest of the talk is going to be in terms of this lattice lambda, so it's important we understand this. Are there any questions about um, the interpretation of this. Yes, uh, David, can you give us an example for a second type of boundary condition how this uh, charge lattice will look? So if we take psi, uh, re, uh, the Iraq fermion with a psi left equal to psi dagger right. So, oh, psi left equals psi dagger right. Um, this is also z to the n. This is, so it's always purely diagonal with the nothing else. Oh, no, no so, sorry. So in the particular case where it's Andreev reflection for every mm -hmm. single fermion, R is minus, and, um, but every lattice site in Z to the N gets, gets, uh, uh, you know, it's, it gets uh, mapped to another lattice site. So for normal boundary conditions and Andreev, this is Z to the N. But for boundary conditions like um, uh, 3, 4, 0, 5, um, th this is a, a slightly sparser lattice, um, and so on and so on. I, I'll tell you one of the properties of the lattice, uh, lattices shortly. I think Thank you.
can I ask um, other question? Yeah, please. Uh, so here, how important is it that you want to preserve U1 to the end symmetry? So suppose you want to preserve some other subgroup uh, of SON. I mean, so instead of uh, just charges, you have a kind of bunch of representations for left and right determinants. Would it be some analog of this R matrix in this case? I, I don't know how to do it. And in fact, there are some very important problems I would love to solve that fall into that category. Yeah. It, it's important that um, you only ha that you have a maximal rank uh, symmetry that, that's preserved to construct the boundary state. It, it's somewhat similar to, um, uh, to the requirement or the statement that you can only solve conformal field theories for, for rational conformal field theories. It's, it sort of feels morally, uh, morally similar to that. If I have time, I'll give you an example of an open problem at the end that um, requires different boundary conditions that don't fall into this U1 to the N um, class. So I would love to be able to, I don't know how. Makes sense. Um, any other questions? All right, um, let, me, uh, let me tell you some results. Ah, before I tell you results, let, let me very quickly, um, a slide only for those of you who know about boundary conformal field theory. If you don't, don't worry. Um, we, we want to construct the boundary state uh, that corresponds to this. Um, uh, this is the boundary state uh, here. Um, I should say that for the most part, we're not the first people to, to construct this. Uh, it's been known for many, many years. You can find it in old D-brain papers by Recknagel and Schomerus. Um, in the context of SPT phases, it was um, stressed in a couple of papers uh, by Shinsei Ryu and collaborators that, that PCFT was a useful way to think about SPT phases. Um, th this weird bra type object with double, uh, double brackets is called an Ishibashi state. Um, it's a state which has the property. Everyone um, It's a state that, that has the property that no current flows into the boundary. That's really what this, uh, this state is telling you. Um, it's labeled by um, uh, charge vectors for left and right movers under the various, um, various U1 to the N symmetries. And it has this coherent uh, state type, um, type expression. Um, the general boundary state is then an inter, uh, a linear superposition of these Ishibashi states. And the question is, what's the linear superposition that um, there's, uh, uh, I, I should just stress a couple of things, just, just so you know what all these symbols mean. Um, the boundary state is not unique. Uh, if you fix the charges, uh, there's a bunch of parameters um, that you still have. These parameters I've called theta here. Um, a, an a, a better way to think about theta for the, for the string theorists. Um, if you're writing down a boundary state for a D-brain, uh, the analog of theta is, is just the position of the D-brain, or, or sometimes the Wilson line around, uh, around circles. Um, so the boundary state isn't unique in that case, you, you can move it around. This is the, after going from bosons to fermions through the usual bosonization, this is what becomes, just these phases are uh, uh, theta. There's a very annoying phase um, that sits here, um, which uh, actually this wasn't seen in the literature before. As far as I'm aware, we're the first people to, um, to, to understand this. It's important for one of the things I'm gonna tell you about, but um, it's horrible and it's absolutely horrible. It, it's, it, you can find it in the appendix of one of our papers if, if you really care. It's one of these really annoying subtleties that you hope you never have to deal with and it just turned out we had to deal with it um, for this paper. The important thing, however, is, is this coefficient in front. So um, whereas in quantum mechanics, you don't care about the normalization of a, a state in the Hilbert space, uh, for these boundary states, the normalization is crucial. Um, it's related to something called Cardi condition. Um, and understanding this normalization um, is one of the most important things in, in this talk. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about this, this normalization. So the, the importance of the normalization was first um, uh, stressed by Affleck and Ludwig um, back in 1991. And this coefficient is called the boundary central charge. Um, what Affleck and Ludwig realized was, um, was the following. Uh, if you compute the partition function uh, of this system on an interval, then there's two contributions to the partition function, or say the free energy. Um, there's one contribution from the bulk, but then there's an extra contribution that comes from the boundary itself. And the contribution from the boundary is proportional to um, this number GR. So it's called the boundary central charge. The right way to think about it is that somehow it's capturing the degrees of freedom which, which live on the boundary itself. 
It, in particular, I, I said in the introduction that one way to impose these boundary conditions would be to cook up little rotor degrees of freedom that lived on the boundary. Um, this boundary central charge is, is somehow telling you the number of such degrees of freedom that you would need to write down at least at low energies after interactions have been taken into account to impose these, these kind of boundary conditions. So that, that's the, the meaning of the central charge. Um, like other central charges, um, it's something which decreases under RG and that's going to be important later. Um, so it's a measure of the degrees of freedom that live on the boundary. Um, we can ask what's the central charge for, for our states? Um, well, we, we calculated this in the paper last year. It has this very nice, pretty expression. Um, the central charge, boundary central charge for um, our chiral states is the square root of the volume of the primitive cell of that lattice lambda. Okay. It's quite pretty. It's also quite intuitive. I, I said that the, the wilder, the more wildly different, the left and right moving charges, the sparser the lattice lambda and the bigger the volume of, uh, of this primitive cell. So that means if you want to impose really weird boundary conditions where left and right movers have wildly different charges, you need to have a lot of degrees of freedom on the boundary in order to, uh, to do that. This somehow is capturing um, that number. Uh, to, to give you some sense, if you impose normal boundary conditions or Andrea boundary conditions, this central charge is just one. If you impose the kind of boundary conditions associated to a Pythagorean triple, um, three and four and five and zero, or in general, A and B and, five and C and zero, um, this central charge is the square root of the, the larger number. Marcello, you asked about the kind of lattices that you get in general. This is one characterization of, of those lattices. Yeah, I think now I, I see slowly. Uh, the... um, we, we thought we were the first people to write this down, but actually Costas Bacchus got in touch with us and, and, and just pointed out there was a very similar formula that, that he wrote in a paper with Ilke Brunner and Daniel Rogenkamp uh, some years ago. Um, they were computing the tensions of D-brains in, in certain models. This boundary central charge is also the tension of, uh, of D-brains. Um, th their formula is the same as ours, but it takes quite a lot of work to show, to show the equivalence. So um, we were sort of scooped by, by almost a decade by, uh, um, uh, by these people. All right. Um, I said at the very beginning, because of this mod 2 anomaly, uh, there are two different classes of boundary states. All boundary states fall into one of two different classes. Um, given the charges that we preserve, the next question is which, which state, which class do you fall into? Is it the kind of class that would give rise to a Majorana zero mode or the kind of class that, uh, that would not? Um, that we also figured out in this paper from, um, from last year. So there's the following um, rather nice formula. Th th there's going to be two formulae in this talk that um, I'm I'm quite proud of, but feel there should be a deeper understanding. And, and th this is one of them. Um, this is the number of ground states in a system. If you put boundary conditions R here and boundary conditions R prime here. So a system on an interval with different boundary conditions on, on the two ends. And um, it's the square root of the volumes of the primitive cells of the two lattices divided by the volume of the intersection lattice, the, the lattice which you only include points that are both in lambda r and lambda r prime. And then you multiply by this square root of the determinant um, factor where the, the prime here means you get rid of any zero modes that happen to be in the determinant. Um, yeah, I feel like this formula is crying out for some simple explanation, but, but um, we don't have one. In fact, in this paper last year, most of the paper was taking up with um, trying to understand the properties of this, this formula because it's not obvious it's an integer of all these square root factors um, and in fact it turns out it's not an integer so it was quite a lot of work but after a lot of work we could show that um, this number was either an integer or it was square root of two times an integer um, remember this is the number of ground states in a compact system number of ground states should always be an integer um, the fact that there's a square root of two is is this sort of recurring motif that square root of two is telling you that there's a Majorana uh, mode floating around somewhere. So if you plug in um, R and R prime into this formula and you find a square root of two, it's telling you that R and R prime live in different, uh, different classes for these boundary conditions. But by the way, going back to something I said at the introduction, um, the, uh, um, the boundary conditions are closely related to gapped phases. Uh, gapped phases in one plus one dimensions also have a Z2 classification. It's the classification that Kitaev discovered uh, um, 20 years ago. 
And the question about which class you're in is a question of whether the boundary conditions are boundary conditions associated to a trivial SPT phase or a non-trivial uh, SPT phase. All right, so here's a couple of simple uh, properties of these, um, uh, uh, the, these boundary conditions. Um, David. Yeah, Anad. Yeah. So uh, what are the transformations that you can do on R and R prime, which keeps this formula invariant? Is there some understanding of that? I mean, I mean that's basically changing somehow the, both the boundary conditions. Am I correct in understanding that this changing both the boundary conditions without changing the ground state? Yeah, I don't think there are simple, um, si simple transformations that you can do. Yeah. And in fact, given an R it's, it's, or an R prime, it's not, it's not obvious to us which, which class they live in. You plug them into this formula, you figure it out. But actually, for the case of n equals 2, we had a much simpler classification for two fermions. Um, but to, to do with um, the Euclid parameterization of Pythagorean triples. But we don't have any kind of simple classification for R and R, for which phase they live in, R and R prime, for, for more than two Dirac fermions, other than plugging into this formula and figuring it out. All right, um, the, the next thing I want to tell you about is how these various boundary states are connected. Um, and I think um, that there's quite a pretty story here. So um, you have a system with massless fermions moving in on the line, and, and then something going on on the boundary, which is imposing these, these boundary conditions. And a very lovely story about boundary conformal field theory is, is that the zero plus one dimensional boundary acts in many ways uh, just like any other conformal field theory. Um, actually, I said that incorrectly, like any other quantum field theory. In particular, um, there are operators that one can insert on the boundary. Um, those operators can be classed by their dimension uh, as irrelevant, marginal, or relevant. Uh, the marginal is when the dimension is equal to one. One because that's the space-time dimension of, of the boundary. Um, if you add an irrelevant operator, to the boundary, it doesn't change the, the boundary conditions for low energy scattering. If you add an exactly marginal operator to the boundary, it changes the boundary condition in some smooth way. So it moves you among a family of, of boundary conditions. For example, those parameters that I, I call theta in my boundary state, there are marginal operators that are associated to changing theta. Um, finally, if you add an irrelevant operator to the boundary, it disturbs your boundary state and it pushes it to a new one. There's an RG flow that happens on the boundary between um, the UV boundary state and the, and the IR boundary state. All the RGs going on on the boundary, in, in the bulk you always have massless fermions and their masslessness is not endangered by this RG flow. It's only to do with the question of the boundary condition um, changing. But, but by the way, I should stress that um, as with all RG flows, it's usually hard to know where you're going to end up if you start from a, a particular uh, UV fixed point which IR fixed point you end up with. Um, in particular, the condo problem, which uh, has been solved in simple cases only, um, is entirely a question of which boundary condition you end up with after enacting an RG flow. Um, in that case, for a marginally relevant operator. Um, but you know, this general question of RG flows for boundary is very, very similar to the general question for RG flows in general. Um, in particular, there's a beautiful theorem um, called the G theorem, which tells you that under an RG flow, the central charge must decrease. Uh, in fact, um, this was the, the first of these kind of theorems was proven by Zamologikov. Uh, that's the C theorem. Um, this was the second to be proven. It was proven by Friedan and Konechny uh, back in 2003. It was conjectured by Affleck and Ludwig um, in their original paper. Um, there's also a, a much more recent, um, very interesting proof using entanglement entropy by uh, Cassini, Landea, and uh, Taroba from a few years ago. All right, so, so the question is the following. We have these boundary conditions that preserve certain symmetries. I want to perturb them with a relevant operator and ask where you flow if, if you perturb them. So the first question we need to ask, what, what are the possible operators that I can use to, um, to perturb them? Uh, this turns out to be very easy to, to understand. Um, you do it firstly by computing the partition function for the system on an interval. Uh, Reading from the partition function, you can extract all the states, their energies and their charges, and then you use the state op operator map, which for boundary conformal field theory tells you about boundary operators, not, not bulk operators. So um, the upshot of that calculation is that uh, there are operators um, 
boundary operators associated to vectors which don't live in lambda but live in the dual lattice uh, lambda star. Okay, so all operators are characterized by a vector in the dual lattice. Um, uh, given a vector, you immediately know what their dimension is and what their charge is. Uh, the dimension is half row squared and the charge is, is given by this. Okay. Uh, again, a little bit of intuition. Um, boundary conditions that have very different left and right moving charges have very sparse lattices, lambda. But that means they have very fine-grained lattices, lambda star. The dual lattice is fine-grained if the real lattice is... Um, uh, is, is sparse. Um, that means that um, there'll be many vectors in lambda star close to the origin, and in particular, many operators, therefore, of low dimension. So the more, the more different the left and right moving charges, the more relevant operators to perturb by. So somehow th those wildly different uh, boundary conditions are rather precarious in the sense that you can have more relevant operators. So the question we'd like to ask is, in general, if you turn on um, a relevant operator, um, you destabilize the boundary condition, but you end up with a new boundary condition. And what's the new boundary condition? How do you relate um, uh, these things? All right, so we're going to perturb by a relevant operator labeled by some vector rho. Um, those operators carry a charge, and therefore perturbing by them necessarily breaks the u1 to the n symmetry that I wanted to preserve. Uh, and in general, it breaks it to u1 to the to the n minus one. Um, to figure out where we're gonna end up, um, I need to make one assumption. And with this one assumption, uh, everything else follows. I should confess immediately, the assumption is not obvious. Um, and um, you, you, you might think you know, that there's no reason to believe this. What I hope to convince you is things work out so nicely that, that you'll, you'll agree that this assumption seems, seems very reasonable. Um, the assumption is that you have a u1 to the n in the uv, under the RG flow, you have a U1 to the N minus one. We're going to assume that when you hit the IR, um, a whole U1 to the N is restored. So there's somehow an accidental symmetry in the IR that you get a new U1 to the N. The U1 to the N in the IR though is not gonna be the same as the U1 to the N in the UV. It's gonna be a different U1 to the N. Um, in, in some sense, it's disappointing that this works. You see, if you ended up where you just had U, a U1 to the N minus one symmetry, this would be a new class of boundary states that we don't have any access to, that we, that we don't understand using boundary conformal field theory. Uh, as I said in response to a question, we need to assume the full U1 to the N, even just to write down these, these boundary states. Um, if you, however, assume that you, you restore a U1 to the N, we're back in the class of states that we understand, and then we can start to explore the properties of, of, uh, of this assumption and see where indeed you end up. Um, so uh, what happens? Well, uh, the u1 to the n has to be non-anomalous, um, has to satisfy that Toft anomaly cancellation condition. It, it turns out if you have n minus one non-anomalous u1 symmetries and you want to add an extra one, there's only two ways to do it. Um, one is what you had in the uv and the other one is, is where you must end up in the ir. Um, so if you start with a bunch of symmetries in the UV, you perturb by a particular operator, the IR charge matrix has to be, um, by anomaly conditions alone, has to be the UV charge matrix reflected in the plane uh, perpendicular to the vector row, as it turns out. It's the only way of solving the, the Toft anomaly cancellation conditions. Um, if this were, were true, uh, well, if this is where you end up, um, you might naively think that the infrared boundary central charge is given by the fo following formula. Um, and then there's a very simple check of whether our assumption is correct. The simple check is, uh, is this smaller than the UV boundary charge? Because the G theorem says G has to decrease as you, uh, as you flow. Um, it turns out that this is not the right answer. There's a bunch of subtleties and caveats that we have to take into account which means that this naive central charge is a lower bound, but the actual central charge can, can be significantly higher in the infrared. Um, as we'll see, the end result is going to be that the, U, the infrared central charge is always smaller than the, the UV central charge, but just by the skin of our teeth. Um, so somehow we pass this G theorem constraint, but, but barely. Uh, you know, we, a few times we thought we would fail. It turns, out, uh, it turns out we didn't. Let me very quickly tell you what these, um, uh, some of these subtleties are. 
All right. Um, I've told you that all boundary conditions fall into one of two classes, this SPT classification. And when we were first looking at this, we assumed that under our G flow, you would remain within the same class. It turns out that doesn't happen. That uh, you start with a boundary condition, you undergo our G, roughly half the time you flip SPT class from one to the other. Now, um, this confused us. How, how can it possibly be? Um, consider the following experiment. You have a system on an interval where the two ends have to sit in the same class, the two boundary conditions. That's perfectly consistent. Now you perturb the boundary conditions on this end and you undergo RG. Where you end up now is a boundary condition with different boundary conditions from different classes on the two ends. But that's an inconsistent situation. How can it possibly be? The only way that this can be is if the system somehow dynamically generates an extra Majorana mode um, to cancel the anomaly. Um, I said this was a, you know, a boring, trivial way to cancel the anomaly, is just add one by hand. Here, the RG must be generating an extra Majorana mode for you. So we claim that um, if you flow from a boundary condition in one class to a boundary condition in another class, the system must generate an extra Majorana mode. That extra Majorana mode increases the boundary central charge by this famous square root of two factor. Okay, caveat number one. Um, caveat number two, I'm going to gloss over actually. It, it's a slight, slight digression. Um, caveat number three is the following. Sometimes you perturb by an operator and you don't break u1 to the n to u1 to the n minus one, but there's an extra discrete symmetry which is, is left. And if you look at the candidate boundary state uh, in the infrared, that candidate boundary state is not invariant under that discrete symmetry. Now, again, that, that's problematic. You, you had a, a discrete symmetry everywhere down the RG flow. There has to be a discrete symmetry that survives in the, in the infrared. Um, the only thing to do is to sum over the images um, of that, uh, that boundary state. Again, this, this raises the central charge. But by the way, for string theorists in the audience, there, there's a, uh, a very simple analog of, of this. If you start with an unstable D-brain, it's quite possible that an unstable D-brain, a single D-brain, decays to multiple lower dimensional D-brains. Um, that's uh, a kind of situation that, that in the boundary conformal field theory language has, has exactly this sort of, uh, sort of picture. David, sorry, I have a, maybe a bit naive question. I mean, is there a way that when one solves these boundary RG flows, one is somehow making an assumption that there is a bulk boundary complete decoupling so that uh, what happens at the boundary never changes really what's happening in the bulk? The, 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 the assumption is um, that you're looking just at low energy physics at the end of the day. That, that's the assumption of boundary conformal field theory. So th there is a decoupling, but the decoupling is the usual kind of RG decoupling. That, that if, you, if you really wanted, you know, cogs and wheels on the boundary to, to impose these boundary conditions, they come with a scale and you're looking at, at energy scales of scattering way below the, the dynamics of what's happening on the boundary. So that's the only sense in which there's, uh, th there's a decoupling. So since the bulk is gap, then this decoupling is kind of controlled. No, the bulk is gapless. Bulk is gapless. Yeah, bulk is gapless. Massless fermions in the bulk. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I have to think about it then. All right, so, so there's a bunch of subtleties, and, and we, you know, we, we stumbled upon them one by one, and we, we had to sort of fi figure them out. Um, when the dust settles, we end up with the following, I think, rather remarkable formula. Um, the infrared central charge is equal to the UV central charge times the square root of the dimension of the operator by which you perturb. Um, I've never seen a formula like, like this before. Again, it, it's crying out for some explanation. Um, and I don't know what that simple explanation is. The, the proof we have is you, you do the calculations, you figure out every subtlety that can possibly happen, and at the end of the day, you, you, you get this. Um, it, it's very rare. It's very rare that if you, if you just know the UV central charge and you know the dimension of the operator you're perturbing by, you have enough information to figure out after the RD flow where, where, where you end up. Um, it's certainly not my usual intuition for the way RG works. Um, if anyone has any ideas or anyone's seen anything like this before, I, I, would, I would love to know. Um, notice 
it immediately satisfies the G theorem. It, it satisfies the G theorem because by definition, a relevant operator has dimension less than one um, on the boundary because one is the space-time dimension of the boundary. Um, all right. This is the end of, of the RG part. Um, what's left is a, a couple of other um, sort of comments and applications, one on a Z8 classification of SPT phases, the other on the kallen rubikoff effect. But given that my, my time is up, I think I'm just going to stop here and uh, take questions. And if there's questions about the applications, I'd, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Clap for everybody. Okay, what are the applications? <laughs> All right. Um, let let me. Uh, yeah. There's so. There's rather lovely classifications of interacting SPT phases. Um, one of which occurs for two plus one dimensional field theories. So there are two plus one dimensional field theories where if you're on a manifold with boundary, there are Dirac fermions that live on the edge. And uh, the Z8 classification has a very nice interpretation in terms of these Dirac fermions. Um, and why, ah, okay, good. Um, this is, by the way, this is work of Fidkowski and Kitai, a very famous work from a little over 10 years ago. And what I'm going to tell you is a slight rebranding by Ryu and Zhang and, and Qi. Um, the question is the, is the following. Take uh, fermions in one plus one dimensions, massless fermions, give them a mass, and ask, is it possible to give them a mass preserving left and right fermion parity? Now, um, obviously, you give them a mass, you always preserve fermion number. But if you just write down a quadratic term in the action, very clearly you break individually left and right fermion parity because it's psi left, psi right is, is the mass term. Um, what um, uh, Fidkowski and Kitaev, and, and as I said, this rebranding by, by others show, is that if you have eight Majorana fermions, it's possible to give them a mass while preserving this left and right uh, parity. It, it's really rather a, a striking statement. In terms of boundary conditions, it becomes even more striking. Um, it's a statement that if you have a boundary condition, um, left moving fermions turn into right moving fermions. But it's possible to have a boundary condition where um, the, not the, the fermion parity of left movers and right movers is conserved. In other words, the mod two number of left movers and the mod two number of right movers is conserved. It, it's very weird because our usual boundary condition is left mover turns into right mover. That, that clearly changes this, uh, this left and right moving fermion parity. Nonetheless, it's possible to write down boundary conditions that, uh, that do this. Um, in fact, they were first written down in 95 by Maldacena and Ludwig. This was uh, Maldacena before Maldacena was, was Maldacena. Um, they didn't realize anything about SPT phases uh, and the, the connection was made in a paper by uh, Cho, Suzaki, Ryu and, uh, and Ludwig a few years ago. Um, but uh, the general question you can ask is, of all the boundary conditions we've written down, which of them have this remarkable property that they preserve both left and right moving fermion parity? Um, it turns out that uh, this holds if um, the lattice is even. The even means that, that every point in the lattice, the, uh, the length squared to every point is an even number, not, not an odd number. And so then there's a, a question you can ask, when can you have even lattices uh, of the type lambda r? Um, remember lambda r is defined by one lattice being rotated into, an, into itself by, by this reflection matrix. Um, that, that's a, a problem which, which we, we ask many mathematicians, they all agreed it was really interesting and they all said they had no idea how to, uh, how to solve it, which is sort of mathematician speak for they can't be bothered, I, I suspect. Um, but, but they did give us enough encouragement so that um, uh, Philip spent, spent a couple of months and came up with a beautiful proof uh, of when this can happen, a proof involving some short exact sequences. Um, and it can, only, it can happen only when this lattice has a dimension which is a multiple of four. Um, now, remember the N was the number of Dirac fermions. That means that it can only happen when you have eight Majorana fermions or a multiple of eight, um, which is precisely the expectation from, from the classification of SPT phases. 
So that's one of the, um, uh, uh, the applications. This is a result from our paper that came out on Monday, actually. Um, the, the other one is an open problem due about the callan rubikoff effect. Um, and in modern language, it's the following. Uh, take a chiral gauge theory in three plus one dimensions and put in a Toft line. A Toft line is like a heavy magnetic monopole. Um, the claim I want to make is no one knows how to do that. It, it's, uh, it's not at all clear how one can insert a Toft line in a chiral gauge theory. The problem is that a Toft line is defined by imposing boundary conditions on fields. The boundary conditions that you have to impose on the chiral fermions in three plus one dimensions um, turn into uh, the kind of chiral boundary conditions that I've been describing here, but not within this class that a U1 to the N is, is, is satisfied. Um, and in fact, they're boundary conditions that, that uh, just aren't known in, in the literature. So here's a, here's a particularly simple example. Um, this U, a single U1 gauge theory in three plus one dimensions with vile fermions with charge one, five, minus seven, minus eight, and nine. This probably doesn't look familiar, but it's the simplest non-anomalous chiral gauge theory in three plus one dimensions. The gravitational, mixed gauge gravitational anomaly also cancels. That, that's, uh, that, that, that's important. Um, the chiral boundary conditions, you want to preserve both SU2 rotation around the Toft line and the U1 gauge symmetry. It turns out that the left and right movers have to fall into um, representations of this, which, which sit in the following representations in U1 charges. But, but because it's an SU2 times U1 and not a maxim Cartan U1, uh, this doesn't fall in our bunch of, uh, class of boundary conditions and no one knows how to write down these boundary conditions. So I, I think there's a very important open problem here in, in three plus one theories uh, um, that falls very firmly into the, the kind of things that I'm discussing but, but remains unsolved. Um, all right, now I've finished my talk, so uh, thanks for the question. Other questions? Yeah, and Francisco. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I have uh, some, some, some confusion, so maybe my question is, just, is a stupid one. Uh, so at some, some point, so you have this, um, you are saying there is a Z2 SPT classification of uh, the of the quantum mechanics um so when i have a spt uh, classification I, I usually think uh, this is classifying toft anomalies so uh, I, I have some uh, global symmetry and this spt phase in the bulk is classifying for me toft anomalies of of the boundary but here you are saying that so first of all i will ask to ask you in this case what i mean is the z2 a symmetry and if, if it is why you're saying that it is a um inconsistency rather than a Toft anomaly? It, it's, it's all t tied up. So let, let me tell you the full story for, for one plus one dimensions. Um, take a single Majorana fermion, okay? Uh, give it a mass. Um, you can give it a mass with a positive sign or a negative sign, okay? Uh, implicitly, there's a regulator, Pauli Villas fermion in, in, in the background, but um, with a positive sign, it's in the trivial phase. And with a negative sign, it's in a topological phase. And the topological field theory is minus one to the half invariant of the Riemann surface. Okay. okay. That's, that's the SPT phase in, in uh, one plus one dimensions. Now, um, put that on a manifold with a boundary. Okay. It's the, the top anomaly of, is supposed to emerge in the field theory of, of, of the boundary. Um, if you put uh, the Majorana fermion with a positive mass on the manifold with boundary, there's, there's no zero mode. If you put the Majorana fermion with negative mass on the manifold with boundary, you get the Majorana mode on the boundary. But the Majorana mode is inconsistent. But so too is the topological field theory minus one to the R defined on a manifold with boundary. But the combination of minus one to the R on a manifold with boundary and a Majorana mode stuck on the boundary together is, is consistent. So that's, that's the uh, relationship with the Toft anomaly. It's not quite a Toft anomaly because it, it's somehow, a, you know, I, I don't think a single Majorana fermion you could think of as, a, as having a Toft anomaly. Oh, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it's a Toft anomaly in minus one to the F actually in that case. So could I somehow, uh, uh, I don't know, give up one minus one to the F and try to formulate a quantum mechanics that doesn't have minus one to the F? 
and then have a consistent quantum mechanics or or, or, or I don't think so possible. yeah I think minus one to the f is special and, that, and that's why this is an inconsistency ra rather than the usual case of a top denominator if you just if, if it's just a top denominator yeah I think it's I think it's minus one to the f which is yeah more crucial to keep than, than other symmetries okay so for this one dimension Majorana fermion, which action is lambda lambda dot, uh, the, the assumption is that it's a spinner in the sense that it's odd under minus one to the per f. If we don't impose that, I mean, usually in higher dimension, this is spin statistics, but in, in this zero plus one, why why you have to impose that it is odd under minus one? That and together with the statement that lambda lambda is, is vanishing because these are anti no, lambda lambda dot, the action is yeah, lambda. yes, but but because it's a fermion, you can't write down lambda lambda. Yes, I agree with that. Yes, that, 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 that's really the, the essence of it. But it's, it's the fact it's a fermion, not a boson. So it, it obeys Pauli. You are saying that it's a Grassmannian variable. Yeah, but the Grassmannian variable and the relation with minus one to the per f is the spin statistics, right? Yeah, although quite whether that's uh, what that means in quantum mechanics, I'm, I'm less sure about. So really, it's the same as Grassmann variable. Yeah. 